Good morning and welcome. Let me invite you to take your Bibles with me and turn to the Old Testament book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 8. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 8. Today we are beginning a brand new sermon series called Psalms, Our Hope in God. You know, the book of Psalms is a well-loved collection of poems and song lyrics that appear in our Bibles. Many of these psalms were originally set to music, and that the tunes, the music, has been lost to us over the centuries. Many of these songs were written by David. Others were written by other folks. Some of these psalms were sung by David as he tended sheep on the hills outside of uh, Bethlehem. Other psalms were sung by David as he was an adult, being chased by King Saul, and later when David became king. Still other psalms were sung by the people of Israel as they made the various treks to and from Jerusalem as they attended the various feasts. And these psalms were actually called the Psalms of Ascent. Now there are 100 and 50 psalms. And I imagine that if we took the time and went around the, uh, uh, you know, if you asked a room full of people, uh, we would discover that everyone has their favorite psalm. Although a lot of folks would just cop out and say the 23rd psalm, mainly because that's the first one that pops into our minds. But over the next few weeks, and may I venture the next months, we're going to look at a number of the Psalms. Now, there's absolutely no way that we're going to try to cover all 150 Psalms. We're only going to cover perhaps 10% of the total Psalms. And I hope that you'll find these Psalms familiar, and I also hope that you'll attempt to at least memorize one or two verses from each of these psalms every week. I promise you, you will be glad that you did. And by the way, <coughs> let me challenge you to read these psalms out loud. Verbalize them. Speak them. I'm telling you, it'll light your fire as you proclaim the worship and praise in these verses. It'll make you feel better. Now, I'm speaking from experience. Try it. You might feel a little awkward at first, but before long, you're going to be walking through the house going, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Believe me, that's a whole lot better than listening to all that garbage they're feeding you on the nightly news. Now, the key point I want you to take home with you as we study these psalms is that our hope is in God. So today, we're going to actually begin with Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is an intriguing song of praise to God. This psalm was written by the shepherd boy, whom God turned into a king, by a boy who became the man known as the man after God's own heart, a young man that we know by the name of David. Now you can almost imagine him as a young man lying out on a hillside. His father's sheep are bedded down for the night, and David looks up into the night sky, and he begins to be filled with wonder as he sees all those stars and the planets as they make their trek across the sky. There's something about a clear night filled with a huge moon and bright shining stars that create a sense of wonder in most people. And this is probably what inspired David to write these words. Psalm 8, beginning in verse number 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength 
because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. <coughs> now the second word, Lord, is the name Yahweh, which was the unspoken name of God, and it means the self-existent one. The second use of the name Lord is the name Adonai, and it's a title that reflects that he is the master of everything. So the first phrase literally says, O Yahweh, our Adonai. The use of O Yahweh focuses on God's otherness or separateness from us. The phrase, our Lord, helps us see that God is personally involved with us. God is powerful and he is also personal. Now, this dual orientation is a key to understanding this psalm. You know, we get into trouble when we emphasize one of these at the exclusion of the other. God is both beyond us and right near us. If we focus only on him as forgiving and loving and not expecting too much, we can trivialize the Almighty. On the other hand, if we picture God as removed from us, as one who is mysterious and distant, we can feel like he's impossible to know. If we know Jesus as our Savior, then God is both above all and he is in us. God's name is majestic in all the earth. That means that his name which stands for all that he is, is excellent and is famous in the earth. There's no one else like him. He is omnipotent and incomparable. Notice verses 3 and 4 again. He said, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him. You know, God gives us more than just a passing acknowledgement. He concentrates us. He dotes on us. There was a father who told of taking his family to the Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado. He said the sky just seemed more brilliant than they had ever seen it, and the stars were so close that you felt that you could just reach out and touch them. And their three boys decided that they would put their sleeping bags out on the ground so they could go to sleep watching the stars. And the man and his wife had just settled down for the night when their youngest son came into the tent dragging his sleeping bag with him. Well, what's the matter, his parents asked him. Is it getting too cold? No, he said. I just never knew I was so small. So we can imagine David looking up at the majesty of the sky and being filled with awe. And suddenly he feels really small. But the whole point of Psalm 8 leads us to a huge truth. And that is, <coughs> you and I matter to the majesty. Now, the first few verses focus on God's glory. The second half of the psalm answers the age-old questions, what is a man? How do we fit into the cosmos? 
What is our purpose? Why are we even here? And by the way, those questions can only be answered as we come to grips with who God is. And any attempt to find out who we are apart from the one who made us is doomed for failure. We must always start with God. How could a God who created all of this beauty, all of this creation, be concerned with us? How could such a man, uh, God be mindful and care what happens to man? You know, in David's mind, it just did not make any sense. David was right, and it doesn't make any sense to a lot of secular scientists today. You know, the late Carl Sagan was a well-known astronomer and equally well-known atheist of the past century. On his popular science program, Cosmos, he said these words, We live on an insignificant planet of a humdrum star lost in a galaxy, tucked away in some forgotten corner of the universe in which there are far more galaxies than people. Carl Sagan painted a portrait of a trivial planet inside of a dismal solar system <coughs> located in a backwater galaxy that was dwarfed by bigger and more impressive star systems throughout the cosmos. <coughs> Sagan not only asked why would anyone be impressed with mankind, He asked why anybody would even be impressed with our planet, our sun, or our solar system. Now, what would prompt Carl Sagan to say that? Well, first, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in our God, so he had no reason to believe that our world would have any significance at all. But second, he had seen and heard a great deal about the universe, and what he'd seen and heard made him scoff at our galaxy having any importance. As an astronomer, he knew that there were upon billions upon billions of stars, and many of those stars are a thousand times brighter than our sun. Carl Sagan also knew that our sun was called a yellow dwarf star. Now, do you have any idea why our sun is called a dwarf star? It's because it is a really small star. It's literally dwarfed by the size of other stars in the known universe. The fact is that our sun is dwarfed by so many other stars in the universe, it has caused some scientists to say the sun is rather a commonplace celestial object. It is a star of ordinary dimensions and of ordinary brightness. See, these folks look at the heavens and not only say we seem insignificant, but they believe that we really are insignificant. But David didn't think that. David never believed that. Why not? Because David knew that God had created this world just for us. He wrote in verse 6, You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. As far as David was concerned, if God made this world for us, including the sun, the moon, and the stars, you can count on the fact that it's not some humdrum planet in a backwater galaxy. Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking and all the other scientists who thought our Earth was trivial, they had their telescopes pointed in the wrong direction because it's in the heavens that God writes his love for us. What God thinks of us is more important than what we think of ourselves, or what others think of us. Do you know that astronomers have discovered that the universe has a center? 
And guess where it's at? You know, according to the what's called the Hubble Law, there's a concentric pattern to the universe that implies that our galaxy is very near the center of the cosmos. That's why scripture can say, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And of course, then there's our so-called humdrum, ordinary star that you and I call the sun. But actually, it's not all that ordinary. (coughs) Back in 1974, the McMath Solar Observatory at Kitt Peak in Colorado began a 32-year-old study of the stars. And by 2006, they had studied a number of stars, including our own sun, and they arrived at the conclusion that of all the stars that they studied, our sun was one of the most stable of all the stars. Whereas most stars gave off wild fluctuations and flares and eruptions that would endanger any life that anywhere near them, (coughs) they found that our sun varied by six one-hundredths of a percent during the entire 32 years that they had recorded and observed it. In other words, any other kind of star would have fried us by now. But our sun, as we have observed our whole lives, we have no reason to fear it. Again, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. And then there's our solar system. You know, we have planets. We have Mercury and Venus. And Venus is about the same size as Earth. You've got Earth with our moon that goes around the Earth. You have Mars that's about half the size of the planet Earth. And then you have an asteroid belt. And beyond the asteroid belt, then there's Jupiter. And Jupiter is so big that you could fit over 1,300 Earths inside of it. And then there's Saturn. You could fit about 764 Earths inside of Saturn. Then Uranus and Neptune are roughly the same size. Roughly 60 uh, Earths could fit inside those planets. And Pluto is actually smaller than our moon. And so that's why they can't even decide if Pluto is even a planet or not. Now, here's the question. (coughs) Where are all the big planets in our solar system? Well, they're at the outside of the solar system, farther away from the sun than we are. Now that alone is peculiar, because in solar systems around other stars, astronomers have discovered up to this point that the bigger planets are often much closer to the stars, to the suns, than ours is. So why do you think God would plant these huge planets farther away from the sun than we are? Well, the Bible doesn't necessarily say, but I think I've got a pretty good guess. You know, scientists spend hours upon hours worrying that some interplanetary comet, an asteroid, a meteor, is going to careen into our solar system and crash into our planet, destroying all life as we know it. But over the centuries, that kind of collision has rarely happened. Why? Well, think about those big planets out there. Any extraterrestrial debris that would head towards Earth would have to get past those four huge planets. And whether there are meteors or asteroids or any other large rock flying at us, they would have to get by those planets. And that would be a pretty tall order in and of itself. 
But then notice something else. There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And any meteors and asteroids not only would have to get past those four uh, huge planets, but they'd have to penetrate that asteroid belt to get to us. And few do. But if they did manage to get past those huge planets and that vast asteroid belt, we have a little thing that goes around our Earth called the moon. Now, <coughs> have you ever looked at the moon through a telescope? What do you see on the moon? Well, there's craters. Now, how did those craters get on the moon? If anything got past those huge planets and got past that asteroid belt, not much would get past our moon. But if anything did, well, have you ever seen a shooting star? Do you know what a shooting star is? Those quote-unquote stars are really interplanetary rocks that literally burn up entering our atmosphere. They put on some amazing light shows, but pose little danger. And as a result, very, very few large objects from outer space have ever made it to our Earth. Now, I could go on and on and on about how special our galaxy, our solar system, our sun, and our planet is in the universe. Our galaxy sits very close to the center of the universe. Our sun is one of the most stable stars in the universe. And our solar system is uniquely designed to protect our planet from the ravages of space. Even the position of planet Earth, its distance from the sun, its distance close to the sun, puts us in a unique position. You know, if our earth were a million miles closer to the sun, it would be too hot to live here. And if our earth was a million miles farther away from the sun, it would be too cold to live here. But we are 93 million miles away. And that means we are at the perfect spot for us to have the right temperature that we can live on this planet. God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? But you know something? David didn't know all of that that I've described to you. All David knew was God cared for him. And he could tell it by the beauty in the skies at night and the warmth of the sun that met him each morning. And because David understood that God loved him, throughout the Psalms, David would say things like this, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. When I said my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. He said, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. He said, Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Therefore, David wrote, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. You see, what David was trying to say was this. If you look up into the skies and you begin to think that you are too small, you are too insignificant for God to care for you, you're not. And David wrote that he knew that because God created this world just for him. In Psalm chapter 8, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8, David praised God with these words. <coughs> For you have made him, that is man, a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. 
You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. If you get a chance sometime, take a look at some of the photographs that are being taken from the Hubble telescope or the brand new James Webb telescope. And just look at those vivid pictures of some of those galaxies and nebulas and star fields. They're beautiful and spectacular to behold. So why did God create all of those galaxies and nebulas and solar systems that we can only see through a telescope? God created all of that just for us. And that proves, at least according to David, just how much God loves us. So if that's all true, how come we don't feel all that valuable and important? How come we don't feel as if we deserve God's love? Well, the reason we don't feel worthy of God's love truly is we don't. Something inside of us gnaws at us because we know that we've done things and we've thought things and we've said things that would embarrass us so much that we'd want to crawl under some dark corner and pull something over ourselves to hide. Because we know that's true, we know that the verse that says, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that's true. We have fallen short. We all have sinned. We know that there is a price that needs to be paid for our sins. We know from Scripture that our sins condemn us, and the price for those sins is death. We don't deserve God's love, but God loves us anyway. And God went one step further to prove how much he loves us. Yes, he created all of this world just for us. But God knew that we would need something more. As something that would help us deal with the pain of our own failures. And so God sent his only begotten son to die on a cross just for you and I. What is man? that God would even care. Jesus was the first to prove that God cares for us. You know, the Greek concept of God was that the gods were more interested in their own concerns than in the good of humanity. The Jewish concept of Jehovah was that he is unapproachable and terrifying and transcendent. The deist concept of God was that he is uninvolved with mankind or even with creation as a whole. But Jesus shows us that God came near. He loves us. He cares for us. He helps us. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. On the cross, Jesus proved the truth of the words of Psalm 103, where David wrote, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. On the cross, God did that for us. On the cross, God proved how much he loved us. 
On the cross, God gave us a message of hope, a hope based on the fact that God was offering to forgive us all of our sins, to cleanse us from the filth of our past, to free us from all of our guilt and from all of our shame, and to give us a new life and a fresh start. God did that on the cross. You know, we've come a long way from the day when God made mankind to have dominion. Great things have happened. Inventions have made life easier. You know, the Sons of Liberty made us stand for independence. We've looked for ways to subdue our planet and have headed out into space looking for other worlds to conquer. We've done well. Or have we? See, there's still one thing we don't have dominion over. You know what it's it, what it is? It's you. Humans have never learned to subdue sin. It was unleashed into the human bloodstream by Adam and Eve, and it continues to infect lives today. That's the root of the human dilemma. We're image bearers of God, and yet we're marred by the magnitude of sin. Humans have been made in the image of God to rule and reign as a divine agent in charge of the earth. But because of sin, we have rejected God and pursued ultimate destruction for both our planet and ourselves. But Jesus came, and he dealt the devil a death blow. And when we put our faith in him, we will become who God has made us to be. He is fashioning a new creation of men and women and boys and girls (coughs) who reflect his image and accomplish his purposes in the world. Psalm 8 highlights that God's glory is above the heavens, and yet it reminds us that he can be our God. He can be your God. But that can only happen if you decide to live your life under God, under his authority, under his word, under his values, under his purposes for your life. May God help us to see how much he loves us. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you today. We thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how much you love us. How you created all of this world, all of this universe, just for us. Lord, as we look at those beautiful pictures that have been taken through telescopes, Lord, we see those stars, we see those nebulas, we see those planets. Some of them are so far away. (laughs) Even if we got into a rocket ship, and flew at the speed of light, it would take thousands of years to reach some of those places. Lord, there's no way in our lifetime we could ever reach those places. The only way we even know that they're there is due to the pictures that we see. Lord, we thank you for those pictures. We thank you for the beauty because we recognize that you created all of it just for us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to see your love. But more than that, we pray that we would experience your love because we know that Jesus went to Calvary to pay for our sins. We pray today that you would help us, Father, to Seek your will. Help us to 
Find your love through Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. May God bless you. Uh, we're going next Sunday. We're going to continue this series out of the Book of Psalms. As we said, we're not going to be covering every psalm, but we're there's 150 psalms, and so we're hoping that we can uh, see you then. Uh, next Wednesday, we continue with our live online Bible study out of the Book of Second Corinthians. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m., live <coughs> on Facebook. Thanks again for joining today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.